subarctic and arctic breeding grounds and they migrate down to our relatively mild estuaries to spend their winters and they depend absolutely on um, on the um, on, on, on these estuaries to, uh, to feed and to rest throughout the winter months um, such as these this flock of golden plover and golden plover is one of the species that's particularly important um, that the tortoise is particularly important for um, another species is is lapwing and I should say a big thank you to Martin Batt who's a, a local resident and, um, and keen photographer and he's provided a lot of wildlife photographs that I'm using in my presentation so thank you Martin as well as big flocks of wintering water birds uh, the tortoise estuary is, is also really important for for rarer species um, like the great white egret uh, pictured here and and the spoonbill and uh, and whenever you're going out for a walk around the estuary it's always worth bringing uh, uh, taking a, a pair of binoculars with you because there's always great things to see uh, in terms of wildlife spectacles so as well as the water birds the estuary is also nationally important for its uh, its coastal habitat such as the salt marsh uh, that's pictured here and those of you who know the estuary will probably recognize Eiley Marsh RSVP nature reserve now these salt marshes are incredibly important for wildlife they they help support and sustain those water birds that I've uh, described. But they're also really important for the, uh, for the specialist salt tolerant uh, plant communities that they host, and also for, for highly specialized uh, benthic invertebrates that they, um, that they provide habitat. So really important wildlife habitat. But these habitats are also incredibly important for society. Um, so salt marsh is known to be a very effective buffer of um, wave and tidal energy. Um, so it provides a very effective natural flood defence. And one of the uh, benefits that these salt marshes generate that's only really just recently been, um, been discovered and properly researched is its ability to soak up and absorb atmospheric carbon. Um, which is obviously a really important function uh, in a time of a, claim, of a changing climate and when we're looking to uh, mitigate the impacts of, um, of climate change. So these, these habitats are incredibly important for, for wildlife and for society. So the estuary is, 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 is a fantastic place for wildlife, but there are real threats uh, to that wildlife and real challenges. Um, and uh, apologies for the um, for the complexity of this uh, table, uh, but I'll just um, highlight in it. Um, it's essentially it's the Met Office's latest projections for sea level rise, um, and the um, and, 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 and the, the uh, figures that I've um, highlighted there are under a medium emission scenario. So, uh, so an emission scenario that we that we that we have to work hard to um, to um, deliver. You're still looking at uh, sea level rise just across the, uh, the Bristol Channel from the Tor Torridge in Cardiff of uh, between 35 and 81 uh, centimetres, so an average of, um, of just under 60 centimetres of sea level rise. Even if you, um, if you go for the high, highly optimistic um, low emission scenario, uh, the Met Office is projecting sea level rise of between 27 and 69 uh, centimeters uh, in, in in the area which gives an average figure of just under half a meter and these figures these are this is sea level rise by 2100 so in 80 years time so we're looking at um, a situation around our coast which is going to see considerable change over the coming decades and considerable time. now why that's such an issue for um, for these estuarine habitats is um, illustrated in the, in the next slide um, and it's a process called coastal squeeze. So under a natural um, estuarine uh, situation, rising sea levels um, would push uh, the intertidal influence um, landwards and the, and the intertidal habitats would migrate landwards. Uh, um, and and, and the, there'd be an uh, overall balance of, um, of new habitat to compensate for, for the habitat loss to rising sea levels. Where you've got a hard sea defence, which is, um, is obviously the case around much of the Tortori estuary, as it is around many of our, um, that natural process of migration of coastal habitats isn't able to happen. So what happens is, as the sea levels rise, they squeeze out the intertidal habitat between the rising sea levels and the hard sea defence, and that's, that's known as coastal squeeze. And obviously, if you're looking at uh, 
somewhere between 50 and 60 centimetres of sea level rise over the coming decades, that's going to have a very considerable impact on the intertidal habitats around the Torbury Estuary. And, um, and as, as the intertidal habitats are lost, both the wildlife that depends on them and so all the benefits that society derives from them. Another issue that wildlife on the Tor Torridge um, is, um, is, is having to deal with is disturbance. Um, and those of you who know the area will know it's, it's a very well used uh, estuary. It's a fantastic place for people to, uh, to walk and, and to walk, walk their dogs. And I was involved in commissioning this bit of work um, by a local ornithologist and scientist, a, a really good bit of work that went before last, which looks at high tide around the Tortorridge estuary, so the, the areas where water, water birds, when they're pushed off the intertidal habitats by, um, by rising tides, they depend on a small number of, of high tide roosts where they, they, they seek refuge and the, uh, the, 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 the tidal period before they're then able to move back into, into, onto the intertidal habitats as the tide drops. And essentially what this study found uh, was that almost all of the main high tide roosts around the Tortorridge estuary are regularly disturbed by, uh, by people and particularly dogs off leads. And that's a problem because a lot of these water birds have a very sort of fine uh, energetic balance. If they're forced off um, their roosting sites, um, they're having to spend a lot of time Time in the air flying around until the disturbance, source of disturbance had left, or they're having to fly off to a, a, another um, high tide roost, which is potentially also disturbed, and they're using up a lot of energy when they do that. And to compensate for that lost energy, they have to try and forage to get more, more food, and they're not always able to do that. So that, the, the outcome of that is that birds often they lose uh, condition, they lose body fitness, um, they could um, have reduced breeding success the following breeding season, and it could even increase rates. So overall um, the cumulative impact of all these different disturbance events can have a significant impact on water birds around, around the estuary. But that's just another uh, threat and challenge to wildlife that, um, that um, water birds are facing on the estuary. So that's a doom and gloom bit uh, done with. The good news is that the, the estuary's got some uh, great opportunities for um, creating new coastal habitats. And this was a bit of work that was done by Devon Biodiversity Records Centre, just looking at the physical properties of land around the estuary. And it estimated that nearly 300 hectares of, um, of intertidal habitat uh, recreation opportunity exists around the estuary. So we've got a situation where there's a fantastic estuary in terms of its, um, its wildlife. That wildlife is under threat. Uh, but there, there are really good opportunities to do something about it. And really that's the basis for uh, the concept of the Cane Wetlands project that I'll talk about. Now focusing in a bit more um, on, the, uh, on the project area, onto Horsey Island. Um, and um, Horsey Island is, um, is, is an area that's got a, it's got a fascinating and highly dynamic uh, history. It was claimed from the estuary in the 1840s for farming. So a new uh, coastal fence was, uh, was built around uh, what, what had been, uh, as the name suggests, an, an, an offshore island um, and, and, and the land was then agriculturally improved and it's been used as farmland and, uh, and, and freshwater sort of marshland and wetland uh, in the 170 years since. It suffered um, many flood events over that period, uh, as you'd expect, including a sort of catastrophic event in 1910, which punched five different uh, breaches through Horsey's outer bank. And uh, most of 2011 was spent repairing that flood bank and it almost uh, bankrupted the, the landowner at the time. So it's got a really interesting uh, and, as I say, highly dynamic history and that dynamic nature uh, continues into the modern day. And here we have an aerial uh, shot of all the island um, with uh, the Tor Estuary south, the, uh, the, the River Cane uh, to the east and Braunton Marsh to the, the north west. And I just wanted to sort of describe to those who, who, who might not be familiar with the site, um, how it's operated uh, recently. So Braunton Marsh is a large area of freshwater grazing marsh 
uh, landward of Hawthorne Island, um, and it's heavily drained, and, uh, and 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 the area drains out of a um, a large sluice called the Great Sluice, identified uh, in the with the red ring uh, in the uh, in, in the image shown. So, so Brompton Marsh sorry, drained um, into Horsey Island, and then that water then drained out of Horsey Island, um, where the second uh, red ring is to the to the east, um, where it drains into the River Kane, and that's what's happened over um, over um, the decades uh, claimed to be. Now, about four or five years ago, the uh, the, the outlet uh, between Horsey Island and the Kane. Had a had a tidal flap on it, which prevented tidal water from flowing into the site and kept all the islands uh, fresh water. Um, what happened uh, four or five years ago is that tidal flap fell off and wasn't replaced. And that meant that on a rising tide, salt water from the sea would enter uh, the site, and, the, and you've got um, larger area, larger volumes of water in, in entering the site, and they were also uh, saline. And, that's, and that introduced uh, saline and brackish influence to the site, and you started get, getting colonization of salt tolerant plants in the site. So that happened, um, and, and, and that sort of um, development um, of new um, um, intertidal habitats essentially um, took place over, over the period of several, several years, up until autumn 2017, when um, the uh, the, out, the, the place in, the, in, in Horsey's flood bank where the outlet was uh, breached um, with, on, on a high, high spring tide. And uh, the, the image is, is from a lo just local uh, press cutting um, and it shows in November 2017, already just shortly after the breach, the, uh, the, the, the breach is already quite wide and you can see the water levels within Horsey Island, the foreground of the photo, are at the same level as they are in the River Kane beyond it. So it was a fairly sort of instantaneous change in nature of, um, of Horsey Island. And the next image um, is, um, is from the sort of southwestern end of the site, um, just above uh, the White House, for those of you who know the site, looking east. And it shows just how extensively on a high spring tide, Horsey Island um, and so there's just um, there's just a very small areas of, of high land which remain above above tide level on those high spring tides. So you can see what a considerable change happened to the site over the last uh, several years. And that change has obviously uh, has obviously changed the nature of the site, and um, and it's a lot of um, salt marsh uh, habitats colonising like these fantastic um, glasswork plants that, uh, that, 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 that this image uh, shows. And as well as salt marsh plants colonizing, you've, you've also got um, an instant response in terms of the site's value for water birds. Um, so a lot of the estuaries water birds are now attracted into the site and it regularly supports thousands of those big like golden plover. So to become an integral part of, uh, of the estuary in a very short space of time. Now, DEFRA put out a statement um, in response to understandable concerns uh, that the breach of bank could, um, could threaten uh, flooding properties. And, uh, and DEFRA's statement made clear that uh, Braunton is not at risk of flooding as a result of the breach. Um, and even if the Great Bank were to fail or to overtop, and um, those of you local to the site will know that it has overtopped several times um, over, the, over, over recent years. Um, Village would not be at increased risk of flooding, and neither would houses at Velator. But hopefully, that helps reassure people that um, significant properties, significant numbers of properties, are not at risk of flooding as a consequence of, um, of this event. I just want to cover um, coastal policy that pertains to uh, the area a bit because it helps set the context again for. Uh, for the project that, uh, that, that I'll come on to. The coastal policy is contained in these uh, documents called shoreline management plans and the relevant one for the Tortorridge estuary is this one. It covers the whole of North Devon and Somerset in Heartland Point and Anchor Head. Just a, 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 a word of warning about this, it's a decade old uh, this month and it's under review so these, these the policies set out in the shoreline management plans do, do change 
but it, but it, but it is still current and it gives a, um, a flavour of, um, of, of quality relating to this stretch of coastline. And what the shoreline management plans do is it breaks um, the coast down into, into discrete areas and it attributes those policies over a short, medium and long term. And for the, um, for the area of coast that, uh, that, that, that I'm interested in, um, in, in, in in this project, essentially between RMB Chivana um, and out in, in, indeed to, uh, to Crow Point at the mouth of the estuary, the policy in the shoreline management plan is to, is to maintain existing embankment defences up until 2025, whilst investigating opportunities for managed realignment. Now, managed realignment means setting coastal defences back either to highland or to new realigned defences. A medium uh, term policy, and, and because the, the plan is already 10 years old, that's only, that's only five years hence from 2020. Five onwards is to implement managed realignment along this stretch of coast. So the public uh, policy uh, for this stretch of coast is to realign flood banks essentially to create new intertidal habitats. And this is a, a map showing, um, it's taken from the shoreline management plan, which just shows an indicative um, proposal for what that might look like on the ground. And the black dotted line on the map shows an indicative uh, realigned coastal defence uh, and, and you can see that, that that's it's behind all the island and indeed are in behind part of all the mark. Um, just a couple of caveats there, it is indicative and it is subject to detailed study. So, um, so, it, so it's not saying this, um, this is exactly uh, what will happen. I also could say that um, the shoreline management plans, they don't compel any organisation or any individual to, uh, to pursue policies that they set out but what they do do is direct public expenditure and essentially what this means having managed realignment policies along this stretch of coast is that no public funding would be made available to repair or to upgrade flood defences in in this area so um i've been asked um, is is Devon wildlife trust going to repair the breach um in in Horty's bank um and we are investigating um, all, all options. I haven't taken any options off the table, but the wood, the, 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 this tells us there would be no public funding available to, to do that and, that, and and that makes it incredibly difficult. It would be a very expensive proposition. So moving on to um, to the real sort of meat of the uh, presentation, I think what I've done is give uh, give a context, hopefully, to the project which sets out uh, that the estuary uh, is it, fantastic for wildlife, the real risk to that wildlife, but great opportunity to, uh, to do something about it. And, and, and it was really that that um, informed the, the conception of the, of the Bain Wetlands project. Um, and Devon Wildlife Trust um, um, focused in on a particular area of the, of, of, of the estuary that it saw as, as offering a really good opportunity to do something about uh, the, the impacts that I've described. Now, by the cane wetlands, what we mean is, is these areas um, identified uh, on, on, on the map here. Um, so that includes Horsey Island um, at um, um, 87 hectares, um, recently acquired by, um, by Devon Wildlife Trust, and I'll, I'll, I'll come on to that shortly. Um, but it also includes, the, on the eastern side of the River Cane, the Devon wetlands, another 54 hectares habitat and, and this land is in two uh, separate private land holdings and it's been subject to various studies uh, recently which have suggested that the area offers really good really good uh, potential for creating and enhancing uh, wetland habitats um, so part of the project work with the landowners uh, of Chivan Marsh and um, explore their interests in, um, in pursuing those wetland habitat opportunities that exist on that land. So as I say, De Devon Wildlife Trust um, bought um, Horsey Island with the generous, gen generous support of local resident Mark Ansell um, at the end of last year. And we were to, um, to buy Horsey Island as a, as a, as a, as a step in, 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 the, in the direction of delivering this cane wetlands uh, vision. We've been very active since acquiring the site 
um, those of you who know it will know it remains highly dynamic. So it's still evolving rapidly since the breach. The, 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 the mouth of the breach is still, still widening. Um, and the next slide shows one of the issues that we're having to deal with, which is um, this is this is part of the outer bank of Horsley at the um, at the southwestern end of the site, uh, just east of the White House. And what it shows is um, taken from the top of the bank, goes Horsey Island on the left-hand side and the Tor Estuary on the right-hand side. So um, the, you can see significant slumping uh, and erosion of this bank, and that's on the inner face of the uh, of the coast fence. And the reason that's happened is because the defence was never intended to um, to be good for um, for hydraulic forces operating on the on the inside. There was not meant on the inside when those banks were built. So what's happened is saline water has entered the site, killed off a lot of the vegetation on the inner bank, um, and then particularly on high spring tides with a strong easterly or northerly wind, you get a good um, fetch uh, generating waves um, within the site, and, they are, they, and they've been uh, eating away at this bank on the inner face. The so Devon Wildlife Trust is working uh, uh, very actively to address this issue and we're in the process of trying to secure all the necessary consent. It's incredibly complicated, uh, but we hope to be able to, um, we're working with a local contractor and we hope to be able to um, repair uh, in place by before the end of September, so before uh, winter season, and essentially to buy time to enable the Trust to make more informed decisions about future interventions that we might make in the site. So the Kane Wetlands project and, and my focus for 2020 is to explore the feasibility of delivering 141 hectares of exceptional quality wetland habitat, which include visitor, visitor facilities and an education hub to really showcase those, um, those habitats and the wildlife that's attracted to them, as well as year-round access to an extensive network of haulability trails, uh, which lead to bird hides and viewing screens. A really sort of visionary uh, nature reserve which delivers for wildlife and also really delivers in a big way for people. And just looking at, at, at what I'm actually working on this year in order to, to um, in order to explore the feasibility of delivering that project, um, I'm going to cover a couple of the priority focuses of the, of the project now. And the first one is something called natural capital investment. Now, natural capital investment essentially means securing private funding, private investment on the basis of revenue streams that are generated by uh, recovering ecosystems. And Devon Wildlife Trust is delighted that this project was selected as one of just four projects nationally to pilot this novel approach to funding uh, ecosystem recovery. And um, this natural capital investment um, is, is something that's quite well developed in some parts of the world. So in, in the United States, natural capital investment is, is worth something like 25 billion US dollars annually. That's money that's being invested in recovering ecosystems. It's not, it's not a, um, a process that really uh, developed traction yet in the UK. So it's something that, um, that the funders of this work, which we're, we're extremely grateful to, at DEFRA Environment Agency and the Esme Fairburn Foundation, bought from Triodos Bank, we're really keen to try and pump fly into market and, and um, showcase how this might work in the UK. And they've selected the Cane Wetlands Project to be one of these, um, these pilot studies. So we're, we're, we're really excited to have been selected and very grateful for, um, for funding uh, uh, this feasibility stage of this project. Now, what natural capital investment means for the Cane Wetland, wetland project is, 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 is really um, is about focusing in on some of the environmental benefits that the project is able to generate and um, trying to package those up and see if they're capable of generating uh, income. So I've mentioned carbon sequestration and the fact that these intertidal habitats are capable of, of locking up um, and, um, and, and, and securing uh, atmospheric carbon. Um, and um, the, some of the work that's been done suggests that they, they're 
capable of, um, of locking up potentially between um, and four tonnes of carbon dioxide per hectare per year. So that when we think about um, habitats locking up carbon, we, we generally think about woodlands and, and forestry. Um, but, 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 but we are beginning to realise that these coastal habitats are incredibly uh, productive in terms of locking up carbon. And if you can validate that carbon sequestration um, within these coastal habitats and package up as carbon credits, those carbon credits can be sold to business looking to offset their carbon footprint. So there's a market for uh, carbon being locked up in this way and we're hoping um, to, to access that market through, the, through this. Um, a similar sort of process um, is, exists for biodiversity credit. So by enhancing a site's wildlife, you sell that, uh, that, that biodiversity credit to developers who are looking to offset the ecological impact of their developments. So there's a potential revenue stream that can be generated from enhancing a site's wildlife. Um, I've talked about the flood risk management benefits of coastal habitats. And again, um, clearly society pays for um, management through uh, environment agencies, local, local authorities, um, and there's potential there to explore the possibility of, um, of sourcing funding to pay for management benefits that might arise from creating vital habitats. And also by, by creating a really high quality visitor experience, um, which visitors are willing to pay for, there's a, there's a potential to generate income from those visitors. So there's a, there's a, there's a number of income streams, revenue streams, um, that can be, uh, that, that, that a project like the Cane Wetlands Project can be generating. And um, the natural capital investment approach um, seeks to draw upfront capital investment um, from private investors on the basis of those revenue streams providing, generating the interest um, that's, that, that's needed for that investment. And uh, we're really pleased at the Wildlife Trust that Triodos Bank um, are working with us to deliver this natural capital investment contract. This is a slide from Triodos. So Triodos Bank, for those of you who haven't uh, heard of it, is at the cutting edge of of this sort of work in Europe. It's really at the cutting edge of natural capital investment. It's got an incredibly strong track record. Yes. Um, and don't worry too much about um, the detail of this slide, but essentially what, um, what Triodos Bank are doing is developing their financial model um, using um, things like the information uh, in the table that I've, um, that I've just shown you and developing a business plan on the basis of that financial model an iterative process of ever refining uh, the business plan more tighter as more information, more data becomes available about the types of benefits that the project might deliver. So that's, that's getting the project to a state of investment readiness. Um, and then the second part of the project, going out with that business plan to, uh, to investors and Triodos, um, a lot of Triodos' existing uh, customers and clients, and looking to uh, secure investment on the basis of that business plan, raise the cap. So that's the, that's the, um, uh, the process that Fidos Bank are going through and they're currently working on, on this bit of work. So it's a really exciting uh, bit, of, bit, of, bit of work we're um, hopeful will, um, will be really, really cutting edge and uh, gem, de demonstrate uh, the proof of this concept of natural capital investment. Just looking at a uh, second of the of the major sort of priorities for uh, this project um, uh, in, in its feasibility stage, and that's the feasibility of developing a really um, a really exciting hub within the Cane Wetlands project. So we know that um, the natural environment in, uh, in 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 North Devon in the in the area attracts a lot of people. So, Huge amount of, of visitors to the area coming because of its rich natural environment. Um, and uh, the Target Trail, as we know, uh, is used by over 200,000 visitors a year, generating uh, or bringing in over seven and a half million pounds of value to the local economy. Looking more widely to the value of tourism to the wider area, over six million visitors uh, a year are attracted to the area, pulling in over 500 million pounds worth of. In, into the local economy. And clearly a lot, lot of those tourists are attracted to the area because of its amazing natural environment. But there's very little in, in, 
in the area in the way of facilities that really showcase and highlight the area's amazing wildlife. And that's the niche that, um, that we're exploring to see whether the cane wetlands is capable of filling that niche and providing a really high quality visitor experience to really showcase and highlight the area's amazing wildlife. Now, community engagement um, was always going to be a significant component of the project uh, this year, and it's one of the areas that COVID has, has, has really hampered. It's hampered our ability to get out and meet people and talk to people about the project and get their views on it. But we have been undertaking uh, community engagement, and, um, and, and we're very keen to continue doing um, so as a, we, well, we've been working closely with Braunton Countryside Centre within uh, Braunton, and we had set up a series of drop events where I would, I, I, I would set up a store within the Countryside Centre and advertise my presence there and talk to people and get, and, and get views about the project. And clearly that's not been able to ha happen with Covid, but as and when uh, Braunton Countryside Centre opens again, um, I'm hopeful that I'll be able to um, and, and, and COVID restrictions. I'm hopeful that I'll, hope, hopeful that I'll be able to an event. So, um, so if you're local and you want to hear more or express a view, please um, please look out for me in, uh, in the Broad Design Centre. Um, the background photo to this slide shows uh, some display materials that the Trust uh, produced and Braunton Countryside Centre very kindly put up in their window display uh, so that um, local community and visitors can, uh, can read about the project and I'll also be uh, putting updates uh, in that window display so, uh, so keep an eye out for information updates at Braunton Countryside Centre. Um, I'm very happy to give talks and I've given, uh, I've given various talks, uh, Zoom based talks um, over, uh, over uh, the last couple of months. Broughton uh, Parish Council last um, week. I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to give uh, more talks. So if you're um, if you're involved in, um, in in a group that would like to hear more about the project um, and express your views on it, please get in touch with me after the event, and I'll be happy to talk to you either remotely or if COVID restrictions allow uh, in person. And I'm also very happy to contribute to newsletters. And again, I've been doing that. Um, so you're likely to be hearing from me if you're in the local area through a newsletter but again if you're in if you're involved in the production of local newsletters please do get in touch and, and, and you think the readers would like to hear more about the project please do get in touch uh, and, 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 and let me know and i'll be very happy to contribute to anything, uh, the new, your new so i hope you agree that um this is an extremely exciting uh, project in, in, in the area i'm certainly extremely excited about it uh, and i'll be very happy to answer any questions you've got thank you Thank you, Gavin. <laughs> I'm, Gavin sat about 10 metres from me here, but uh, it could be in a, on a different planet for, as far as the technology is concerned. Right, so Gavin, I've got some questions, some good questions um, from people in the audience. So I'll, I'll just go through these um, and we'll see how many we can address. So I won't say who they've come from, um, because we haven't asked for consent to do that. So, so the first question comes, uh, and it's this, uh, Gavin. Are there plans to make the wetlands more resilient to climate change during the restoration? Thank you, Steve. So if I just understand that question, um, could, you, sorry, could you just repeat it? Yeah, so the question is asking, are there plans to make the wetlands more resilient to climate change during the restoration? Um, yes, is the simple answer to that question. And so what would those plans be? Sorry, there's a bit of a, an echo, Steve. Could you, could you mute, mute, mute when you're... Off, off? Yeah, sorry. Sorry, uh, yes, yeah, so, so um, if I've understood the uh, question uh, correctly, I mean, the whole the whole, the whole concept really is by creating the wetland habitat, it, 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 it is making the estuary more resilient and its, wild, and its wildlife more resilient uh, to the threats that it faces, particularly level rise. Um, so if I can just give an example for, uh, of, the, of that. So the breach has taken place uh, within, within Orsi Island and, 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 and clearly the, um, the tide comes in um, with every tide now. 
um, and and at, at, at slack tide, at the top of the tide, uh, when, when there's little water movement, uh, some of the sediments that have been brought in drop out. And, and, and so essentially, uh, over, over, over many tides, the cumulative effect of that is that the, is that the, the, the habitats within Horsey Island will rise. Um, and, 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 and that's a very effective way of, of, of making these, uh, these uh, systems more resilient. And it's a way in which intertidal habitats can, control, can, can contribute to flood risk management. And, and hopefully the, the, the ideal is that um, you get accretion happening at a sufficient arch rate that it keeps pace with sea, sea level rise or it even exceeds sea level rise. Through doing that, you get, um, you, you get development of, of saltwater habitats, um, which, which provide very effective flood, flood defences that are also incredibly important for wildlife. Okay, thank you, Gavin. Okay, we've got another question here. Um, it says, how will Gavin, but I, I'm, I'm I think we can extend that to um, the project in general. How will the project exchange experience and ideas with the other three projects funded by the Environment Agency and others? Yes, that's a very good question. Um, all projects are all quite different. Um, so I, I'm not, I don't think any of the other um, three projects that were selected are, are sort of coastal habitat related projects um, I'm, I'm sure there are um, I'm sure there, I'm sure there is learning that can take place I, I, you know and, and, and I, I think it would be very wise for us to uh, for us to communicate about uh, the work we're doing and any potential sort of overlaps and opportunities for um, for sharing uh, sharing good practice uh, but it's but it's not happened yet it's a, it's a very good point so thank you for that Okay, so another question has come in then. Um, uh, it says, how do you plan to balance ecotourism with recreational disturbance? So I, I guess it's asking how can you balance, you know, one of the professed aims of the project is for expanding ecotourism locally, but doesn't that just create more disturbance of the type you outlined earlier in the talk? Yeah, an interesting question. Um, I mean, I think, you know, to be, to be completely honest, there is a risk uh, there. Um, what I would say is that, is that at Devon Wildlife Trust, you know, we, we manage and operate um, a lot of nature reserves, and nature reserves um, are in very large part about, about bringing people in touch with wildlife. So yes, they're about conserving and enhancing wildlife, but they're really about, you know, about giving people really good experiences um, and up-close experiences. Of that, of that wildlife and so I think um, you can if you carefully plan um, the design of a nature reserve you can bring people close to wildlife without disturbing them um, so by using screening uh, by, by creating you know good viewing um, points by even by manipulating the habitat by, by creating uh, wetlands right next to hives for instance and bring wildlife in uh, without without disturbing it, so so I think yes, the, you know the, the honest answer is there are risks there, but by very careful um, by careful planning and management, it is possible to deliver um, you know a, a site that's fantastic for wildlife and, and, and for people. And, and you know these places exist up and down up and down the country. So uh, at a place like the Horsey Island, the King Wet, and so I think it's I think it's eminently possible to uh, to do that. Thank you, Gavin. Okay, the next question is quite a technical one, so I, I'm going to read it slowly. It says, the, the question says, I'm concerned over potential use in carbon trading. Surely the only sequestration available for trading should be, in, be from enhancement over a baseline date. This is a potential field day for dodgy accounting. Yes, I mean, I'm not, I'm not uh, sure that I've, in, I've completely uh, under, understood the question. I think I do, do get the, I do get the gist of it. I think, um, I think, I think there are risks um, there to the, to, to the whole concept of, whole concept of carbon trading. Um, but, 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 but we do operate in this country um, mechanisms for um, um, that recognise the, uh, the, the, the carbon benefits of peatlands and, and, and woodlands in particular. Uh, there are two schemes uh, that, that currently operate. 
Um, and, and what this project is doing is, is trying to showcase that, that these coastal habitats are also incredibly important for, for carbon. And I think the more we can, uh, can recognise and understand the benefits that these, that these habitats provide to society, the more likely they are to, um, you know, to continue to persist because society will have a, a, a you know, greater recognition of it in, in perpetuating them and in creating more of them. Okay, thank you. Um, there's a further question here. So uh, this person says, how much will it cost to protect the dike from collapse at, as the high spring tides get bigger and cause more collapse on the inner side of the sea dike? Presumably, this is a very high priority and a significant risk to the island completely. So I suppose that question, when the, the question refers to dike, that's what we would call the outer bank. Um, and they're asking about the cost and the potential, I guess, for a sort of runaway event, if you like. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Um, yeah, another good question. And, um, you know, I think any, um, any coastal um, protection work is expensive. Um, that's, that, that, that's the nature of it. And, um, and, and we are the obviously very careful uh, with, um, with, with, with spending our, um, our money and it has to be spent, spent wisely. Um, in, in the short term, I showed, I showed that slumping of, um, of the inner face of, of, of part of the embankment and that stretches for several hundred metres. And we're looking, um, we're looking at, um, a, 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 we're fixing that over the, uh, over the well, we hopefully before uh, the autumn period, essentially to prevent, uh, to prevent that bank breaching. If that bank breached, um, then it would be very difficult to turn the clock back. I think that would have in, that that would have significant um, impacts on ability to manipulate the habitats within uh, within Horsey Island to get the best outcomes for wildlife. And so, so we're, um, we're we're essentially by doing that repair work, we're trying to buy um, a, a number of years in order to be. Um, make sure we're well informed about how we uh, about the decisions we, we make in the future about, about what to do with those flood banks. Um, so the so the answer is yes. It could be it could be very costly um, to you know to shore and repair um, all of the banks around Horsey. And what we're doing in the short term is just doing emergency repair works by a number of years. To, um, to make informed decisions by that time, hopefully, we'll be through this project uh, and other work. We'll get more information together about about the best long term outcome. For the um, but, but, but yes, we're aware that there's that, you know there's, there is a risk of, and, and I've explained that there is you know unlikely to be any public money available to repair the defences. So there is a risk of it becoming um, a bottom of, of money, and clearly the trust um, wouldn't allow wouldn't allow that to happen. But we are keen to explore. All the options and to keep the and to keep the options open in the short term for that to happen and that's why we're we're, we're doing the, this uh, repair work now thank you gavin um next question is it says is it harder to lock up carbon using coastal habitats in comparison to say woodland for example uh well i well i i, I don't think it is i mean i think I think the difference is probably that um, woodlands are, um, are maybe more tangible and demonstrable um, sequesters of carbon. Um, and the science behind um, carbon being locked up in woodlands is more advanced than it is on coastal habitats. Um, a lot of the work on coastal habitats is quite new and, 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 and the realization of how, how significant they are at sequestering carbon, and that realization is also quite new. So I think the issue with coastal habitats is just we're, we're some way behind um, wood, woodland habitats. But um, but 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 I think they are uh, they uh, they have been demonstrated very effective at locking up carbon, um, and, and 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 they do that through the sort of early colonization uh, period in particular, but also ongoing they continue to lock up carbon and uh, and, and fix it into the intertidal subject. But they are, you know, so I would say um, that they, they are very good at locking up carbon. Okay, Gavin. And the next question says, your 
one of your slides shows an area for cane wetland expansion. Is that just farmland or does that cover existing buildings, farms, etc.? I, uh, so I think that that must be referring to Chivana Marshes on the eastern side of uh, of the River Cane, um, and Chivana, Chivana Marshes is a is a freshwater grazing marsh system. So it is um, it is farmland, um, and there are some uh, some old stones for agricultural buildings in there as there were, as there were on on Horsey. Um, but uh, but no, there are no uh, there are no residences or you know or infrastructure. That would be flooded, and um, you know, and and if there were, I don't think I don't think um, the landowners would have any interest in pursuing wetland enhancement schemes. So, so I think um, delivering enhanced wetlands on uh, on dune marshes is dependent on on it being just about um, creating good habitats. It's not you know it, it won't impinge on um, on on property or infrastructure. Thank you. Okay, I'm conscious that we're coming up to an hour, and um, which is probably our allotted time. So I'm I'm going to take uh, just a couple of, of of perhaps two or three quicker questions. Um, one, Gavin, this might not be very fair to you because I don't know if you know much about beavers, but someone has asked: um, Do beavers tolerate salt water, and will they be used in flood defence work if DEFRA allows it? I think I know the answer to that. If you don't, so so I'll let you. Well, uh, it sounds like you know more than me, Steve. But I, but, but, but I do, but I do know that um, beavers do tolerate uh, salt, salt water. Um, so, um, but as to the remainder of that question, I'll, I'll leave. It. I think beavers will tolerate salt water for short periods of time, and it's some evidence that, that they 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 go into the tidal areas of, of the lower river otter where there's a wild population but I think they would need to be predominantly in fresh water um, and certainly have their lodges in fresh water um, so they, they won't be to uh, salt tolerant um, they won't live their, their whole lives and have their whole territories in salt water so I don't think that um, beavers will be a big part of this project um, and we're also quite a long way away um, from actually seeing beavers uh, and further beaver uh, distribution throughout the throughout England so we're actually waiting for the a decision from DEFRA to see what the next stage for beaver reintroduction is um, we should hear by the end of the summer that's one thing we're working on behind the scenes at the moment so watch this space but I don't think beavers will have a big part to play in the cane wetlands no 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 but if I can just say um, Steve just looking at the, the wider catchment and obviously uh, the tour is a is a big river in Devon and um, if, if beaver, beavers are able to um, to expand at their their range naturally, um, then it's quite conceivable in the future that they could create they could generate a lot of benefits within that catchment. For okay, the thank you. Uh, and now a, a specific question about dogs and dog disturbance. Um, will there be a dog ban in place, uh, presumably on the the Cane Wetlands extension, or a short lead restriction? Um, it's a good question. I think um, I think that's a question uh, that will be answered uh, further further down the line. So I think we're in the, we're just in the early sort of feasibility stages at the moment. I mean, clearly, what we won't won't want to do is to um, is to create really good places for wildlife and then and then, and then to, um, to, to to enable dogs to uh, disturb them. So I think we will try and uh, as best we can through design to avoid that risk. But in terms of exactly what the policy would be for uh, for dog walking on the on the nature reserve, I'm afraid that's a question a question to be asked uh, further down the line. And I've got a, a final, and it's a similar point about will there be bylaws to keep jet skiers out at high tide? Which I know actually th th there is quite a lot of jet ski disturbance on the estuary already, isn't there? So I'll let you answer that, Gavin, and then perhaps I think we'll call it a day. Um, I, I, I don't know about uh, bylaws. Um, I think uh, certainly the Wildlife Trust would do its best to dissuade people from uh, taking any sort of um, craft into into Horsey Island. 
it's um, there's an awful lot of energy in the system, particularly around the breach and the mouth, and it's a very dangerous place. So um, I'm not aware that we've had any uh, issues of uh, of that nature. Uh, but if but if we but if we do encounter them, then we we will certainly do our best to explore um, avenues uh, to, to to minimize the risk to the people as well as minimize the risk to uh, to wildlife. Okay. Well, it just remains me for me to thank Gavin um, and thank you, our audience. Thank you uh, for tolerating us, tolerating the IT. And, um, and uh, I, I hope you agree. It was a fascinating talk and I, I really enjoyed the questions as well. Um, this is a project which I think you'll hear more about in the coming months and, and years. Um, I think it's a really ambitious one for Devon Wildlife Trust and, and one that we're very proud to be part of. Um, just two things. One is if you enjoyed tonight and the tonight's seminar, then do remember that we have a series of these taking place in coming weeks and then to go onto our website and look at the what's on pages where you'll see more details of those. I know there's one on wildlife gardening. There's another on beavers coming up. Um, and the other final thing for me to say is if you have enjoyed tonight and you're not a Devon Wildlife Trust member, then please do think about joining us. Um, that's the last time I'm going to say that tonight. Uh, it's the last thing I'm going to say tonight. So goodbye from Devon Wildlife Trust. Thank you.